Welcome to the Barcelona Podcast, episode 168, and this opinion is brought to you by the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. I'm Dan Hilton, and I want to welcome my podcast door-winning friend, Frances Tomas. You beat out some pretty good competition, Frances, but it's quite the accomplishment still, I'd say. Oh, yeah, no, it's a fantastic accomplishment. That is the best thing that I've ever seen in the history of the universe. Well, I, you know, actually, what might be a little bit better, we're, of course, referencing Lionel Messi winning his sixth Ballon d'Or this week, and we are talking about that and much more in La Ronda. But again, Frances, thanks so much that you are joining me once again. Uh, you are my podcaster in crime. But yeah, I wish I had some kind of award uh, in France that I could give you. Uh, but I, unfortunately, since the podcast only started in 2017, this is what, your second award, maybe? Possibly, possibly, but um, I'm still happy with it. Yeah, and I bet Lionel Messi is happy with his six because that is what we're going to be starting this show in La Ronda by talking about. Let's get right into it, right? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. It's going to be um, a very exciting one today. So Ellie asks, isn't the Ballon d'Or just an award for future generations as a historical record? And I did alter his question a little bit, Frances, because you and I, we have talked about individual awards before. And I don't want to speak for you, but I know your stance is if it's not an FC Barcelona trophy, why should I care? You're Kool-Aid, that's what you are, and everything else, whether it's individual awards being biased or whether it's international football having so many other factors involved, club football is club football, and that's the trophies you recognize. I, I understand that. And I think to Ellie's credit, I want to start by answering this Ballon d'Or thing, is that, I mean, as, as anyone would know, I want to plug it, it's, there's a Messi in the Ballon d'Or, how he won it this year on the Barcelona Podcast YouTube channel, this week's episode all about the Argentinian uh, magician. And then on the website, Barcelona, there's also an article about this. And I think winning a sixth Ballon d'Or, Ellie is right, that in this moment, we recognize that bias. If Virgil van Dijk had won, we could say it was biased, but Liverpool fans on the other side saying it's biased towards Messi. Uh, I think Luka Modric winning it last year, if he doesn't make, if they don't make the, the finals of the World Cup, and Madrid doesn't win the Champions League, there's no way. So they, they're basically taking team trophies, or particularly club trophies, and they're trying to reward the top player on those teams. And that doesn't mean that they're the best player. Because, you know, Messi wouldn't have had to wait between 2015 and 2019 to do this. But I think the greater point here is that these Ballon d'Ors, however, do serve as a snapshot in time, as Ellie's pointing out. When he won Messi winning his three first Ballon d'Ors, 09, 2010, 2011... The messy that the numbers that he was able to put up in 2011, and then again in 2015, and actually even this season when he won this year, they are so much larger than what he did in 2009. But that 2009 Pep Guardiola Barcelona team was so so dominant and and almost perfect on the field to the point that he was being rewarded that season as being the best player on the best team, as opposed to this year when it truly was going against the narrative where everyone in the media talks about Anfield and 4-0 and all that, and yet Messi was still good enough to win the Ballon d'Or this year. Yeah, but the thing is, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I don't really care about um, individual awards. Um, I, I have to understand, obviously, that it's better that Messi wins it or one of our players wins it than someone from Madrid, for example. So in that respect, I'm, I'm happy with that. But I think it's more of a popularity concept than anything. I mean, I'm not taking any credit away. I think Messi has been outstanding this year. But then again, he's, he has been for the last 10, arguably 15 years as well. Um, there is no question that Messi is the best player to ever play football, um, ever. Every generation has got their own star. But, you know, I think Messi surpasses them all. Um, but the, and then again, in terms of um, individual awards and recognition for individual sort of merits, it, it, the the criteria changes, you know, because Messi has got double as many Ballon d'Ors as Cruyff and six times more than those who've won it once. So uh, the thing is, things change every year. So, for example, the, the, one of the first years that Messi won it, Xavi and Iniesta were World Cup winners and they still didn't get the award. Um, when in 2004, when Cannavaro was there, he won it. And the list is endless. I mean, if Van Dijk had won it this year, he would have been fully deserving for being the best, most consistent, dominant leader in the team that won the Champions League. But the criteria keeps changing. So that's what I don't quite understand. That's why I don't really believe in it. I mean, if it was always about purely the best player, then that would be understandable. If every year it was about the best player in the most successful team that wins the Champions League, then great, I would understand that. If it was a World Cup year, then the best team in the World Cup team, winning team would win it. Fair enough. But it just keeps changing. And honestly, I just, <laughs> I just keep, keep 
keep getting track of it all. And uh, I don't really, I don't really give it much credit. I know it's a huge hype. I know that it generates a lot of clicks. I know it generates a lot of people commenting on things. But I'm happy that a Barca player won it. But I don't give him any more weight than that. Yeah, and I think to that final point, it, it is an odd thing where in the moment, this is what I, I agree with you to a point. It is a weird bias popularity contest while living it. But then in the future, we do we do talk about it as legacy. I mean, uh, Luis Suarez, the original Luis Suarez, still uh, the first Spanish player to ever win, if I'm cor- not correct, the only Spanish player to ever win the Ballon d'Or. And that serves to help his legacy. So we remember him for Catenaccio in with Inter Milan, but then we remember him with Barcelona, you know, being Spanish and winning uh, the Ballon d'Or and just being this great figure for the club. And when I do look back, it is something where to be individually uh, rec- remembered for the, your accolades and also the things you won, certainly in old in older times, your what you did on the international level, because I, because I, I can think of, and now we're getting a little bit of the weeds and we'll get back to Barcelona in a second, but when I think of the Hungarian teams from the 1950s, Kubala, with all that was going on with him, not featuring for Hungary regularly, just again, just due to his timeline not working out, uh, he was on the older side when those great Hungarian teams were doing what they were doing, and he also had great injuries at that point. But all that said, they're one of the very rare teams that we still speak about with great reverence, and we say that they should have won these major international trophies, and they're one of the few teams I think that does stand out. So unfortunately, when it comes to legacy, and again, this isn't about now, it is a popularity contest, but then 30, 40 years down the future, when my kids are looking back through the, the well, maybe a little sooner than that, actually, probably, okay, so like <laughs> 10 or 15 years, <laughs> okay, so let's say your daughter's in 10 what years. What are you planning to do, Dan? That's too long. I'm going to freeze, yes, my wife and I, we're going to freeze ourselves. <laughs> Because we and we're gonna freeze Messi because we just want to keep this going for the next few decades. But no, <laughs> we're gonna freeze Messi like Walt Disney, just let him rest. Well, so we I, can actually cure him. Yeah, I mean, when when Matteo Messi wins the Ballon d'Or and my kids uh, and my kids' kids, so when my grandkids go back and look at all this stuff, we will be talking about individually what they won, but also the team awards and how those things are connected. So in terms of legacy, though. When it, when it comes to our Barcelona stance, I want these Barcelona players to do their best individually, to do their best uh, on a club level, and I want their legacies to be cemented in all those different ways because I, I do know that great teams get forgotten because they didn't win the big one or have an individual player of brilliance win something. So I, I do think it does, not only does it affect legacy, but I, I'm interested to see, and this is the question I had uh, about Messi, is it's this weird thing where we know he's the best while you're there, and they always say, you don't know the good times when they're gone, but that doesn't apply to Messi. It's the one, that phrase is, he's the one player it doesn't apply to. We know we're in the good times now. We know the time after Messi is not going to be the great times anymore, but we know he's the best player to ever play, and he's still 32 years old. There's no cementing of a legacy. His legacy, his legacy is already complete, and I think you're right. This sixth Ballon d'Or probably didn't affect anything, but it, it does wind up being in 30, 40 years, those teenagers on Twitter that are getting on you about Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi is going to still be the, the, ever, the all-time leader in Ballon d'Ors. And I think for us as kool just hearing that debate get quieter and quieter through the years, I think there is going to be just a little bit of, a little bit of pleasure to that debate kind of quieting through the years. Yeah, I, I think for me the most important point is that um, the director of France Football was actually talking um, to the Spanish media and probably international media as well. I read in a Spanish paper. And um, he was saying that when he called Messi, he was like, really, really, was it me? And, and it, it meant to, it really meant a lot for him, you know. And if he makes Messi happy and, and you know, it's, it's recognition to all his trajectory throughout the years, to everything that he's given the club and obviously his national team as well. Um, I am happy that obviously when he's played for Argentina now, he seems to be having more of a commanding role. And uh, even though the pressure is still on him, there's other sort of younger players that are growing with him. And uh, he got a recent international trophy with his, with his nation, which is great. And uh, if it just means that Ness is a little bit happier um, and it sort of boosts his morale moving forward, then so be it. But um, other than that, I, I don't really buy the whole show. But that's probably me just being awkward. Well, I, I did avoid mentioning I picked five moments on the YouTube video that came out yesterday. I picked five moments this, this past season, basically to the last year, when I believe that the committee looked at it and said, yeah, this guy was the best in the world. I'll give you one little teaser there. You got to watch the rest on the video. But I thought against Real Batiste last spring, when he had the hat trick 4-1, Barcelona just dismantled 
Real Batiste, and he got the standing ovation down in Seville. Uh, that was one of those five moments I thought was established why he was just beyond everyone else this season. Well, good choice. let's move from a guy who has his legacy pretty much already established to a guy that is just starting to carve out a Barcelona legacy, and I hope he has a good one. Eric asked, with a few games under his belt, what is your evaluation of Junior Firpo? Can he be the long-term answer at left back? I don't see it. <laughs> Sorry, unfortunately, I don't see him being a worthy replacement to the likes of Dani Alves, obviously, different side of the pitch. But um, the, the great carrileros in Barca history, like Sergi Bajuan, uh, like more recently, Dani Alves, and, and obviously now nowadays, um, Jordi Alba, I don't see him being of the same caliber. Um, obviously, he's very early in his career. He's still very young. Um, but he doesn't have that connection with arguably anyone around him just yet. I know people lately seem to be criticizing Jordi Alba quite a lot, but he's the one player that when he's missing, other than Messi, obviously, but the one player that Barca has that when he's missing, everything seems to crumble. Um, if you think about it, the, 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 the flow in attack, since Jordi Alba has been away injured or unavailable, it's it's very obvious. I mean, Messi doesn't really have the the flow of provision that he has enjoyed throughout the last three four years, and uh, it, you just feel like there's something missing. Especially because obviously the winger that's playing there, be it Dembele, being you know lately Griezmann, they're not really offering that much either. So uh, when Firpo has played, he's looked all rightish, just decent, but nothing spectacular. So can he be a long term answer? I, I don't see it. You know, hopefully I'm wrong and he's still very young, but I just don't see him being of the same caliber of either Sergi Bajuan or Dani Alves or Alba. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, at the moment, I think it's Jordi Alba's our best left back option. And then there's uh, Nelson Semedo on the left side. He was actually really good yes. at left back. And then it's Junior Firpo. But I, I think in defense of Firpo, just play devil's advocate a little bit. He did have that one goal against Adafi, uh, and he seemed to be gaining some confidence, particularly in that game, but then he got hurt. And then since he came back and Jordi Alba's been hurt, his, his last four performances of 90 minutes at Celta de Vigo, Leganes, Dortmund, and Atletico, he looks really nervous and not at all like the player that I saw last year and watched a bit of at Real Betis. However, I think he's one of those players who, because of a combination of Valverde's instructions, combined with the pressure of playing for an older team with these great expectations and playing with the expectations of winning for Messi, I think all that couples together and it does bring up the idea, and we might talk about this later in the show too, that mentality when playing for Barcelona, as we're seeing when last week it was unfortunate, but the video of Jordi Alba uh, at Anfield was circulating and what it looked like in that locker room. And even these all-time legends, all, even these all-time greats, uh, Shorty Jordi Alba is going to be seen as, uh, as tier two next to Danny Alves, who again, I keep arguing is one of the greatest players to ever play the game. But anyway, Jordi Alba is <laughs> one of the top left backs and top outside backs that Barcelona and Spain has ever had. And yet Jordi Alba, you see mentality at certain moments hasn't been there. And I think across the board, mentality is just so, so difficult. And I, we haven't talked about it in a few weeks, but that goes back to Ansu Fati and protecting him and him having this great mentality showing up on the field. And even we'll talk about Ricky Pooj. I have a question specifically about Ricky Pooj later in the show, but I also do want to mention his mentality, the comments that he makes. He's in his early 20s now, sure. Uh, but mentality is so, so important to Barcelona. And it seems like every passing week, every passing month and, and year as trophies are harder to come by in Europe. It seems like mentality is just important. Everything physical is everything tactical. And Firpo, I think he has all the physical tools. I think what we saw at Real Betis, he could be exactly the player that Barcelona bought. But if his mentality isn't there, that's why he'll never succeed. And I don't think it's anything else. I am interested to see if hopefully he survives to a next manager. But if Firpo survives to a next manager and that manager gives him a little more freedom, I want to see what that looks like if he's able to have a little more freedom and there's a little bit more belief that there are defensive legs behind him. So, Frances, I actually have a question connected to that. You ready to move on? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I was going to say something else. Go. Yeah, so to that point, that I think Firpo has to be a little more passive on the left at the left back position because, as Minor asked, we talk about speed and I've been, you know, you and I have been rambling on about speed and about the team being slow at times. Which veterans need to be benched so that younger and faster talent can play? And the way I see this one, Frances, I'm at a point where I wouldn't start Busquets and PK together or put a combination of PK, Lingley, and Alba on the back line with Suarez up top just for tactical reasons. 
I, I don't think any of those players are at the point where they need to be benched. Busquets is still just as good. I think, as I've sent, said, I think another manager would still bring the best out of him more than Valverde. I think PK has still been a, a, a humble servant. He's still great. But I think him and Langley together, you do lose a little bit of pace. Uh, and then having Alba connected to those, all three of those, Alba gets so far upfield that it does expose Langley and PK in these foot races. Uh, so yeah, I would just say it's got to be staggered when it comes to those legends. Maybe they all have the legs together at the end of a season. But yeah, I don't think it's one or the, I, I don't think you have to bench one or freeze one out. I just, I do think there is a little bit of rotation needed. Yeah, uh, I would bench Busquets, um, not because Busquets is not performing at the right level, which I don't think he is, not yet this season anyway. It's just more to give the young the freedom to to express himself and to and to be who he is. Um, before, in the previous question, I said I wasn't going to say something. and Actually, this sort of um, goes towards the same direction. When you mentioned about Ansu Fati breaking in the team and, and basically feeling as if he was playing in his backyard, uh, despite being alongside Messi and all the other stars, the same thing applies to the young, to be honest. Um, he's coming from Ajax, and he obviously got really far in terms of domestic um, trophies and success in Holland, but obviously, and more importantly, the Champions League. But you never really know how the transitions are going to happen. And uh, the young looks like he's been playing for Barca for 17 years. And uh, that's what you want from a newcomer, someone with personality, someone who can actually add. Um, I haven't heard anyone yet questioning the fact that... Actually, no, I did in the last, last week's show. But the vast majority of people agree that the young should be starting every game and is someone who is here to stay for the long term, which is the same thing that happened to Ter Stegen two, three years ago. No one actually argued that he would be perfect in the long run. And it's the same situation with the young. So um, I think that in order for Barca to take the next step and to truly go into the next generation, the young needs to be given the keys. And uh, for that to happen, Busquets needs to be taken a step to the side. Um, I also think that Luis Suarez um, needs to needs to play less. You know, I know he's been better in the last month. I know that he's scoring. But that is mainly because the fact that Messi and himself um, understand each other so well and, and they sort of see each other's move, movements without even looking. They, they, they sense what each other is doing. But I would say that for Barca to truly go into the next level, there needs to be a, a new number nine brought in uh, or Griezmann given a proper chance in the middle and see what happens because um, you know, Griezmann's career is, is going nowhere at the moment. And, and the thing is, if he thinks that he's going to become the player that he was at Atletico Al Barca, that's not going to happen because it's a different ecosystem. It's a different environment. And uh, I, I would say, in order for Griezmann to have a proper chance of showing what he can do, he needs to be in the centre of attack. And then Luis Suarez coming on for the last 30, 40 minutes even, and then really sort of killing it when everyone else is tired. And that would extend Luis Suarez's shell life, if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. and give Griezmann a proper chance. Um, but other than that, I think Piquet is very valid. I know that he's been criticised lately because of his sort of head being in the Davis Cup and all sorts of other businesses. But I think he's still the best centre-back that we have. And I think that his leadership, his experience and his positioning is, is in the top five of the world still. So I think he just needs to sort of get to the crunch time of the season, put his head where he really needs to be, um, eliminate all the distractions around him, and he's still a very valid player. And uh, I don't think that having Piquet would affect having Busquets in front either. I think they're different positions and they complement each other well. But um, in terms of moving aside, Busquets, then Suarez, and then probably Piquet. But um, I would leave Piquet in the starting eleven still. Yeah, to that Suarez point, Sid Lowe on the Spanish Football Podcast had mentioned or had made the argument that Suarez was so involved in any chances that Barca had against against Atletico Madrid on the weekend, and in particular, obviously, the the goal from Messi. You say most players are going to do that, but he does put himself in those positions, and he does work with him well. And I think it does bring up the chicken or the egg argument that Messi and Suarez work so, so well. They won because... Luis Suarez was and it probably still is just on the final leg of being a world-class striker. I mean, he's just one of the all-time greats at that position, dominated this decade if you look at the goal-scoring records. You know, this generation of them is going to be him and, and uh, Robert Lewandowski. And uh, there's almost a drop-off seemingly after those two. Obviously, Messi and Ronaldo, a different thing. Uh, but when it just comes to number nines, when it comes to actual strikers, this decade just dominated by Luis Suarez along with Lewandowski. And I, I think for Suarez... It does come a point where 
it's a trade-off that uh, Sid Lowe's the point he made was that offensively what he does is still so important. He still wins. He still scores these worldies that come out of nowhere. But I think over the course of 90 minutes, fundamentally what you lose because he doesn't press as much. And in that first half, the second half against Atletico Madrid, there was such a drop off and it was even greater against Dortmund. The drop off in his energy levels and the pressure he was able to provide were just such a drop off. And so, uh, and we can ask a similar question that we won't spend too much time off. He asks, where does our loyalty to starting our veterans end? Uh, and I think each one is different and each one has to be, they either have to be phased out slowly or they have to find a different club. So Arturo Vidal, I wouldn't say he's a Barca legend. Uh, I, I mean, just no. at this point, he just won a Liga, sure. But, I, 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 but he's a veteran on the team. That's fine. But he's a guy that I think if he still believes he has top level football, he needs to see greener pastures or he needs to go to other another club when it comes to Busquets and Suarez and PK all guys that I consider Barca legend I think we would all agree but for those three if they want to stay at Barcelona if this is where they want to end not maybe the final club of their career but this is where they want to end the rest of their prime or end the rest of their top level football well there is some kind of flow there is a way for them to gradually be uh, not pushed to the sideline but to take a reduced role and those things are, we look at all, it's not just Barcelona, you look at across all teams, that seems to be the hardest thing for anybody to do. It really is. Uh, other than Vincent Company recently at, at, at Man City, I can't think, and his was mainly due to injuries. It wasn't even due to Pep slowly getting him out of the team because we saw how important he was this season at the back. But very rarely do you have club legends, very rarely is an easy way to get them with lower and lower time and then to slowly have them solidify their legacy from the bench. It doesn't happen. No, it, it really doesn't. And um, I think that in the vast majority of businesses, the moment that you don't perform or you perform less and someone's going to replace you, I think that for Barca to continue to be successful and be at the very top of, of world football, that has to happen and it needs to happen quicker. You know, um, I think that Suarez, throughout 90 minutes of football, he's reserving himself a lot. Um, he's not running for every ball. He's pressing and he's showing energy and he's definitely showing his um, mala leche, like his bad milk, his aggressiveness, as he's always done and annoying defenders, etc. But um, I think that he can do that for 30, 40 minutes and it will be far more effective. It will be far more powerful and um, he can have a like a Henrik Larsson of the 2006, mm. 2005, mm-hmm. 2004 era and that would suit him really well. And, and to be honest, he would extend his career I think having two players in the team that don't press because, you know, Messi, unless he really wants to make a point, doesn't really press, but that's okay because he's Messi and what he gives you moving forward is something that no one else in the world has ever been able to, to give you and probably no one will ever be able to give you uh, again. So he's excused from that and he has to be so that he can have his um, attacking output. But having two people walking around um, on a defensive transition is, is just... Not something that Barca can afford at this moment in time. So, well, I'll ask you, Francis. Uh, ask you, Francis. Dirk asked to that point. Do you think Barcelona is finally starting to shape up after surviving Dortmund and Atletico? Mentally, more than physically, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Barca's problem is not physical. Um, if you if you go rewind back to, you know, early August, September, then you can argue that. But I think it's more about players actually wanting to to go the extra mile. I mean, you could see it in the in the game against Dortmund. You, you played well throughout the whole game and then the last 20 minutes, the players even admitted, I think it was Lenglet after the, after the game that said, and we let ourselves go a little bit after the game uh, in the last 20 minutes. And uh, that's not something that you can, number one, say publicly. That's a stupid thing to say. But the thing is, it was so obvious for everyone to see that he had no option but to admit it. And uh, I, I don't think that's right. I think that you need to be pushing um, in order to move forward. And the, the, it is the manager that has to see the changes he needs to make in order for the team to be excelling in pretty much every occasion they have. Yeah, I think that perfectly sums it up and where bars are at the moment. But where we are at the moment is an ad break, so we will head to the ad break and be back for two more questions than our lightning round. All right, back from that ad break, we've got two more questions. Then we're going to get into some quick-fire questions, and we like to call it our lightning round. It's been a fun thing we're trying to do. We'll see how it goes. But first, question from Pancho. Do you think Valverde is playing for wins to avoid the boot, especially with other big managers getting sacked? And some of the other big managers I think Pancho is referring to, uh, Pochettino, obviously, a few weeks ago now, Unai Emery from Arsenal was let go, and Niko Kovac from Bayern Munich was also seeing the boot. So it seems like whether that's Tottenham, Arsenal, and Bayern Munich, uh, big managers can be 
uh, gotten rid of around this season, and particularly around the Christmas season, you see it in the Premier League winds up being a merry-go-round. And same thing with La Liga, uh, where I think La Liga, we're still waiting for some of those big shoes to drop. You had Marcelino at the start of the season for Valencia, which was a confusing thing. But no, I think La Liga, it's, it's going to happen soon, uh, but I don't know if it's going to happen to Valverde. But do you think he's managing to just avoid not losing? Well, possibly. I mean, he's on around 20 million euros a year, so you don't really want to get sacked from a job like that. Uh, it's not like he's going to get that, pay that money from anywhere else in the world, really. So it's understandable that he's fighting for his job and wants to keep it. And obviously he won't resign, even if results get really bad. Um, you cannot really blame the guy for doing that. I think it's more to do, as I've said before in the pod, it's more to do with the board actually taking action and making things better um, in due time, not just when it's too late to actually have, um, have a second thought that when it's too late. Um, I think past at this, this time and this season, it's just not dominating games that, they should be dominating. Um, they are becoming more of an ordinary team in terms of what other teams can do is what, what Barca is becoming. I mean, if you look back five, ten years ago, Barca could play whatever game they wanted. They could dominate the games. They could take the game um, sort of up in the tempo. They could just slow it down. They could be retaining possession. Barca cannot really do that anymore under Valverde. And, uh, of course, the manager has got a lot of blame to share there. But obviously, the players are also older. And uh, they're becoming a team, basically, that has Messi as a, as a last resort, but a team of sort of two areas, a team of, two, of, of transitions. Um, Barca, the, the current Barca and the Valverde, they're dominating. Um, they're becoming more pragmatic and more solid at the back, so they're trying to dominate and, and sort of be conservative and not being hit. And then they're hitting on the counters. And obviously, up front, they've got Suarez and Messi, who don't really um, make many mistakes when they've got the chance. So it is, Alberto is taking Barca into an area in which the vast majority of the fan base don't feel very comfortable to be, which is uh, even counter-attacking at times. You know? And uh, that's, to me, it feels unnatural, but that's, that's where we are, or where our current manager is taking us, better said. Yeah, I think you had two two really good points there. One, as as you've actually heard some of the criticism now about Cloyvert comments he's made. We're going to talk about Pooj in a second, but uh, Cloyvert and the Sporting Project when he was hired, uh, you always heard the criticism about Segura, and I, I think that a vision and an idea. We talked about the board as well. That it seems like with the elections in twenty twenty one, that they're making nearsighted decisions, and that and that's fine. And you get the sense, even with the age of these legends that we've been talking about in, in today's show, that we are nearing this end of a cycle for Barcelona, for better or worse. And the end of a cycle is always the hardest because you don't, no team ever feels like they're nearing the end of a, of a sporting project, if you will. Football is very fickle. I, I think that, think of Man City, they are trailing Liverpool in the league right now by double digits. And that project of Pep Guardiola winning the Champions League final, because when Pep Guardiola went to Man City, there was this belief, there was this feeling. They have all this money. They have Pep Guardiola. They have this talented team he's going to build. And how is there any way? I mean, he'll win Premier Leagues, and he did do that. But how is he not going to win the Champions League? And yet they've never even made a final with this project built for him that at this point may not happen. We don't know how long Guardiola, it seems like uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's not returning to Barcelona per se, but there is rumors that his time at Man City could be nearing its end, whether it's this season or maybe the end, he'll step away and do whatever it is Pep decides to do. But to that end, you know, that Man City project was supposed to have these chapters and, and it was supposed to end in this in this fairy tale way, but that fairy tale never happened. And for Barca, with this cycle ending, are they going to have this fairy tale Messi, Suarez, Piquet, uh, Busquets, all of them, they win the Champions League trophy and ride off into the sunset at similar times. You know, that may not happen. That's not how this works. And Valverde is going to... The, his legacy is not going to be very kind to him at Barcelona if he doesn't win the trophies that he needs to win. So I think he's, I think he's playing and managing his squad to win trophies and not to make you be happy with what you're watching. And I, so I, I, do, I don't think he's playing to avoid the boot. I think he's playing just to win and get results that's what he did against Dortmund it's what he did against Atletico Madrid that's what he he's done in the Liga for two seasons now uh and so he's winning he, he's just doing that he's trying to win more than he's trying to you know create this this beautiful thing on the field usually those things work yeah, hand in the, hand the, but they don't have yeah to. yeah the key point here then is that he I think he genuinely believes that this is the best way for Barca to win um it yeah was very telling I think it was the midweek game against Dortmund in the press conference after he said something along the lines of 
people are expecting us to give a masterclass of football every single day. Well, not really, mate. We, we want you to just play football that we can be enthused by, that we can be engaged by. You know, you're not managing Bilbao. You're not managing Atletico Madrid. You're managing Barca. And, and for better or worse, we have been educated from the day I was freaking born <laughs> that Barca is a, is a team that played to attack. They played to win. Is what the, the Brazilians in the early 2000s used to call the Jogo Bonito. You know, we play good football. And that's, that's, that's who we are. It's not, it's not an expectation. It's not a snobbish sort of way of understanding the world. It is who we are. We're not going to be defending like Italy um, with the Catenaccio that you mentioned earlier in the show today. It's not, Barca will never play Catenaccio. I mean, maybe with this board, maybe they're playing Catenaccio tomorrow. But what I'm trying to say is that we've got a way of playing and the success we have achieved has been related to the times in which we've actually played this way. So if we are not going to win, um, which has been the case the last two, three years, this is obviously at international level because domestically, the, the, the thing is, the Valverde approach can win you a league because over 38 games, if you don't concede many goals and you go Messi, then you're quite likely going to win. But to go that extra step, which is what's happening to Manchester United, uh, to Manchester City as well, to go that extra step, you need something extra and you need to be performing at, the, at those levels, at those particular points in terms of concentration, in terms of attacking prowess. And because Barca are not dominating, they're just becoming a, a team like all the others. And that is what needs to change. Uh, Barca still, right now we're in December already, they still haven't found their own game. Uh, Valverde keeps changing in things like the midfield, hasn't found the attacking three yet. There's no continuity. So I don't quite know what where the manager is taking us and if, if we're not going to achieve success at the end of the season which is obviously still up for debate then at least we should be playing the right way not for a not for a sort of big headed way but just for for, for representing and, and making justice to who we are as a club well two players that i think in the next cycle as i've been referring to that could help make the club the thing that we want to see on the field. Douglas asks, how are Puj, and that being Ricky Puj, and Pedri, who's playing at Las Palmas, and he'll be coming most likely to Barca B, but potentially even to the first team next year, how are they developing? Uh, and I just want to answer this real quick for Douglas. Since returning from the U-17 World Cup, Pedri has been put right back in the starting lineup for Las Palmas in the Segunda Division, and he did have an assist against Real Oviedo who have not been too great this year in the Segunda Division. He still needs to work on his defensive positioning, I think. You saw that a lot at the U-17 World Cup. And, and that happens, especially when 17-year-olds play with 17-year-olds. But his offensive skills, uh, as we're seeing even at Las Palmas, they get better as his teammates get more talented and know what to do. So when he's playing with his full professionals, he is better at, for Las Palmas of what I saw at the U-17 World Cup. So I have seen about six or seven matches of Pedri. I haven't seen everything, but I, I have got to see him quite a few times, uh, again, both the U-17s and then at Las Palmas. And I, I think offensively, it's just he reads the game in a way that teenagers usually don't. Uh, it's just operating from the center of the field, but he is technically playing at the left wing position. But I think he does wind up profiling as an attacking mid. The one worry about him, other than his defensive positioning, uh, obviously he was, he's a player that Valverde would just shoot to the moon. It just wouldn't work out <laughs> just because of, again, what Valverde is trying to do and where Pedri fits on the field. He, he doesn't fit in Valverde's yep. system. But that that's said, the problem. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's hitting the nail on the head. That is the key problem. You cannot have a player that talented that the manager doesn't know what to do with. Yeah. That's the wrong manager. Right. Well, and I think I, the worry about Pedri, though, is is he going to be... I think it was an early on worry about Iniesta as well. Is Barcelona doesn't really have a number 10's position. Obviously, Messi wears number 10. He can do whatever he wants. But even when Messi's gone, if Barcelona's going to play their, four, their patent in 4-3-3, they don't really have an, you know, a, a Raquel May spot for a guy like Pedri. So if he winds up being that player in the future, the worry would be that he doesn't really have a natural fit at all on the field. But I think he's talented enough to play on the left wing at, at center mid. I'm not comparing him to Iniesta, but I'm saying that Iniesta... Uh, you know, when Barca, when certain years fit where Iniesta had to play as that left wing, he did it because he was Andres Iniesta and he could. And if Pedri winds up developing into that player that can play at the left wing, you need him there. He can play as, an, uh, you know, one of the, the more attacking midfielder, center mid. And, you know, looking at ages between Puj and Arthur and De Young and all these ones that we are christening for the future generations, those are all guys that Pedri would be in front of. So it does work out with the balance if that's truly what's being built. Same thing with uh, Iesh Mariba. But, you know, we're talking now five, six years down the road, potentially, when all of that comes to fruition. Uh, but the same thing goes, I think, for, for Puja Barcelona B. He was on the bench for one of the team's two losses this year. And while he doesn't get 
goals or assists. He does have two of each this season. But most importantly, if you, you know, of what I've been able to, in limited ways, see of Barcelona B, uh, he does set the tone for matches. And he builds up so much of what they do, and he's so essential to what the, the game plan is for Pimienta's squad. Uh, last season, what I did see of Puj was that he looked ready for the first team, but I was tentative at times when he couldn't put his fingerprint on a match and he couldn't affect the match, if that makes any sense. Now it seems like mm-hmm. a shock to me when he doesn't play a starring role and is the most influential player in every match. Consistency, I think, has been the next stage of his development. And now the next step, the only step, is just higher level competition. There, there's no other way forward. That's what it is. And if I think we've been debating this all fall, whether or not he should go out alone. And the comments between him and Cloyver this week are astonishing. That Cloyver said, yeah, I mean, we'd love to send him out on loan. And Puj goes, no, I want to do what Xavi and Iniesta did. I want to stay here. I want to fight for my spot and earn it with the first team. And it is, it's such an odd thing that the board picks this director picks a guy who played at Barcelona, who understands, is in charge of the, the, the youth in, in Cloyvert, and yet it's the guy in his early 20s, the guy who just stopped being a teenager, he's the one that says that answers it in the Barcelona way. Maybe I'm a little biased here, but Puj answering it the way that you'd expect somebody from La Masia to answer it, it just shows you almost a disconnect, where it seems like the kids are learning the right ways on their own. Where are they learning? In the cafeteria from the lunch lady? Because is it is it really coming from the those the higher ups down? Are they truly trying to instill you know what's happening at Barca? Because it's again it seems like this kid knows better than than the adult. Yep, and that's the key issue. I think that we have discussed it many times. I think the boards um, are not leading the club the right way or the way that um, it should be in my eyes. And you know I'm not the only one. There's millions of people who think like me as well. They're not leading the club in the way that uh, Cruyff envisaged, the, the way that we have been successful. And and that is a shame. That's why you've got a sporting director who can say things like that. Because, you know, if that happened during the Johan Cruyff years, someone, e.g. probably Johan himself, would have had a word with him. And would have said, actually, mate, you're not, you're not, go, you're not singing from the same hymn sheet here. So something needs to happen. Um, you went through fat, through Pooch and, and obviously elements of Fatih and elements of Pedri as well in, in your answer. I think um, all I want to add is that um, I actually saw Pedri play live here in Qatar around two months ago because the under-17s before the World Cup, the, the Spanish under-17s, came to, um, to prepare basically in Aspire here, um, right next to my house really. And uh, I popped down. I, I knew that Pedri was there and lots of other Barca players as well. But um, the, in the game, they didn't have the names on the T-shirts. So I didn't recognize who they were. And there was this guy that just kept sort of zooming from the wing, normally throughout the wing, but um, associating and, and, and passing around and basically dominating the game and, and had like an extra gear than anybody else. And then I went down to speak to the, um, to the Spanish coach, um, one of the assistant coaches. The coach was too busy actually coaching. But I said, is that Pedri over here? I said, of course he is. And yeah, I think that's quite telling. I think everyone knew that he was going to be the star. And I think the next day or two days after that, Barca actually finalized his signing. So um, he's head and shoulders above the others in his age. And I think, um, as, and again, Johan, like Johan Cruyff said, all the good players can always play in the same team. It's just up to the manager to find out how to make the pieces work. Yeah, and that'll be the challenge for he and Fati and all of these other teenage prodigies that you know we've been knowing about and talking about Puj for you know, now three seasons, you know, since we started this show was basically the year that mm-hmm. he started to break out. And it doesn't mean that they're guaranteed a spot in the first team. It doesn't mean they get integrated. It doesn't mean any of that. Uh, so the, the challenges then for Pedri and for Fati is what they do over the next four or five seasons, you know, because again, those guys are still going to be 21, 22 years old, four or five seasons from now. So as we watch their careers continue to blossom, they're head and shoulders above all those around them. So can they still have the mentality every day to do what Messi did at, his, at this age and want to be the best and want to really just compete against yourself and be the best that you can be. If they can do that, and again, you know, it's a, it's a theme throughout this episode, it all comes down to mentality. So I, I think we got to have the proper mentality to try to wrap the show up soon. So we're going to do the lightning round. Here we go. We got five. Nope, make that six questions. Leonardo asks, should we start considering selling Busquets instead of Rakitic? No, Busquets cannot be sold. Uh, Busquets is a player that's going to be a passer for life. And also his market value is debatable. So, no, I think he's, he's someone who needs to um, nurture the next generation and, and cannot be sold. 
Yep, I agree. Rakitic against Atletico and uh, Dortmund was, yeah, he was good. He was back to being what uh, what we feel he has been. For me, unlike Arturo Vidal, he's a club legend, but he's a club legend that needs to be sold in January to just balance the squad a little bit better uh, and, and try to bowl in some money because Barca seemingly have not gotten enough money and have not got enough return on their investment either, uh, as, as whether it's Coutinho or at the moment mm-hmm. Griezmann, Dembele. They've, they've thrown a lot of money away, so Rakitic is going to have to get some of that back. That said, Jalen asked, while Rakitic is around, should De Young be dropped into the, the defensive midfielder role so Rakitic can play the right interior? I, I, I don't know about that. No, I, I don't think Rakitic, as soon, and I was going to say a second, but I've decided not to. I don't think Rakitic was that good. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I thought that, and it's not necessarily his fault. The guy hasn't played for three months, you know, and he has his confidence sort of knocked out. Um, and... I don't think he was that exceptional. I think Rakitic was as good as Rakitic is, you know, and, and I don't think he, I mean, without Busquets being there, he was the one that filled the void. I think the young would have been better in that position. Um, I, I think that Kules are happy that he's coming back. And don't get me wrong, I'm not ungrateful. He's been great for Barca for four or five years. I mean, 2015, he was a key player, but um, it was a different Rakitic. He was a more attacking, more youthful, more ambitious, more hungry Rakitic. And, uh, Valverde has sucked the life out of him in the last three, four months. So I think that his passing was clumsy most of the time. And uh, his fight was there. His willingness was there. So, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. I, I'm probably I'm the only one that thinks this because um, I haven't read anyone say anything differently. But I don't think it was that exceptional. Sorry. No, I, I just think it was a positive sign. I think everyone, and people just grasping for straws to look at something positive about Rakitic. And trust me, I mean, you are not alone that Rakitic is, every time he sees the field, is slandered all across the internet. But when it comes to just uh, the tactics of it, uh, I, I think De Young, the only way, as I mentioned, he gets moved back to a defensive midfielder role is if the two other midfielders in front of him are the more attacking threats. I mean, at the moment, De Young is still... Yeah the best dribbler in the midfield. And our target may give him a run for the money in that, but I don't think he can touch De Young at the moment. So I think De Young continue has, to, has to continue to play that right interior for the time being. And Rakitic has turned himself into a, a you know, defensive midfielder. That's where he's best position is in Busquets' spot. You know? And so the idea yeah. would be he would be the backup to Busquets, but that's, again, not how the rotation has worked this year. But speaking of Artur, Vilmos and Charlie Barca both asked the same question. What's up with Artur? Is it a fitness issue or Valverde doesn't trust him? I don't know, Frances. I think there's something going on here that we may never know about, but there's something about when certain Brazilians come back from international break, it seems like it takes them longer to find their fitness again. There seems to be a little hitch. And this has been happening with Arthur now his whole Barca career, if you remember, that uh, mm-hmm. every time he comes back from an international break, it takes a game or two whether to him to refine fitness or whatever it is. I, I'm not sure if he just doesn't fly on planes well, if he's not getting the proper... He just doesn't, uh, he doesn't, they usually have a fitness test when they come back and maybe he's not passing the fitness test when he comes back, even though they're only on international break for what, 10, 12 days. Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what he's eating. Again, maybe it's just, he doesn't do international travel well, but I'm hoping it doesn't have to do with his character and personality. If there's something happening off the field that we don't know about my hope that it is just simply something that is, you know, it doesn't affect him, but I'm hoping that it's just something that is having to do with his something physical. I hope it's, uh, and, and not injury, but I just think it, it just might be travel. I hope it's that related and not related to something that has to do with his character or the people he's associating with because Barcelona have a reputation of having Brazilians who do like to party a little bit. Uh, and Arthur, we know that he does have a kind of crowd that even though he seems more reserved on the field, the crowd that, and the company he keeps off the field is a little more rowdy. So uh, you do have to ask questions there. And I think that's what it comes down to. I don't know of what we see. There's no way that Valverde doesn't trust him as a player when he's in full fitness. Because you see what... We, he has to see the same thing we do. I mean, Arthur's He's a starter. That's what he is. I, I, don't, I don't see what Valverde could see unless, again, it's fitness or something related to that. Yeah. So if he's a starter, then he should be starting. That, that's, that's my view. I think that if you cannot crack it at... How old is he? 22, 21? It's very, very 22, young yeah. still. Yeah, so being that young, I don't think it matters how many miles you've traveled. You, you should start, you know, because he's not the only one that's been traveling. I mean, Luis Suarez or Messi or whoever has been traveling as well. And I don't see that as an excuse. I think it's more about, about the manager not actually knowing what he's doing. I mean, if he's trusting the young, he's trusting Arthur, and he's trusting whoever his third one is, seems to be Busquets at the moment, 
then just just roll with that because you know it's December now. Uh, you had three three and a half months if you include the preseason to actually play around and to actually work out what you're doing. At this moment in the season, you need to know who your starting eleven are, and you need to uh, rotate them when they're injured or rotate them when you're playing against lesser teams in La Liga. Um, and then you need to roll with it. And if Arthur is a starter, which I think Arthur should definitely be a starter based on the performances he's given on the pitch, then there should be no doubt he should be playing every game yeah. unless he's unavailable because of fitness. Yeah, correction, he is 23, so that doesn't change anything. But Jorge asks... Big mistake. Big mistake. <laughs> Kill me, Dan. Kill me. <laughs> Jorge asks, what are the chances of selling Suarez and Dembele for Lautaro Martinez of Inter Milan? 13 goals in 19 matches so far this season. As I mentioned, uh, Barca are going to have to do a lot of selling before they do any buying. So I would, I would say that Barca are in the market for a number nine, but Lautaro Martinez might have actually played himself outside the realm of uh, what is affordable. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think that the, the, the next uh, forward that Barca sign would be Neymar, though. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would say, because, I mean, Messi is very clear. He's got, what, two, three seasons left? His best years um, in the latest sort of five, six years have come with Neymar in the team. I think he wants him back. I think he will be a great addition. Uh, obviously, injuries permitting. Given everything that Messi has given Barca, I think his last wish <laughs> before he goes is to play with Neymar again. I think Barca are going to do all they can to, to grant that wish, um, even if um, it means offloading, say, Dembele or Griezmann, Rakitic, I think is going um, now in terms of this winter transfer window. So I think that's the next signing that we'll have. Um, if Martinez continues to develop, he could be a chance for the future. But I don't think you sign Martinez until Suarez is done, done. And if he takes a Larson role, which I argued before, he's still got another two, three years left, Suarez himself as well. So I don't see it. Yeah, you're right. I think the timeline doesn't work out. I, I think that Martinez is already too good for you know having to take a secondary role and another club will go after him and give him a starring role. So I think you're right on that uh, to that end. Uh, Ted asks, would you take Marcelino as the Barcelona coach or another second-tier coach who is excellent at getting a team to the top four but then hits a plateau? And Marcelino, I think he is actually going to be remembered more fondly for how he was basically became a martyr when he left Valencia. I, I think for Marcelino, I saw flashes and moments, but there was certainly consistency in his squad, that he got the best out of Valencia gained him the fourth place, but we remember that the reason they had to fight for fourth place last season was because they started the year so poorly. Uh, so for Marcelino, I don't think he's ever been a big team whisperer, and I think there's an established set of coaches that could come to Barcelona, and I think Marcino, Marcelino just might not be there. No, I think that the Barca coach uh, moving forward has to be someone that knows how to handle what being a Barca manager is. And that, that's got to be someone who's been a player before um, for us, uh, or someone that has been working very closely as an assistant manager with someone who really knew what they were doing in terms of someone that's worked with Guardiola, someone that's worked with Luis Enrique. I think that would be, that would be a good step forward. But you've got to know what you're getting yourself into. Obviously, if you get someone like, I don't know, Jurgen Klopp or someone like um, the manager at Ajax as well, so someone that has proven the worth at yeah. international level. Then, Eric then Ten that's, Hag, that's an yeah. Exception. Yeah, that, what is it, Ben Tag? Eric Ten Hag, yep, from Ajax, yep. So Ten Hag for Ajax would be a good choice as well, but it's got to be agree. someone who's done something at international level of worth. And um, with all due respect, I don't think Marcelino has done enough to be able to lead Messi, the Suarez, etc., into the next generation. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, the hip choice in Tifo football, this is where I'll end this, that Tifo football put up a video this week that Sujith is asking about, what about Marcelo Gallardo? And he's the River Plate manager that just lost in the Copa Libertadores final to Flamengo. And, I mean, you want to talk about passion. I don't know how much you want to talk about tactics, but if you want to talk about passion, uh, it was about, what, two, three weeks ago, that Copa Libertadores between River Plate from Argentina and Flamengo from Brazil. They, I mean, Gallardo being the River Plate manager, he might have lost that, that match, but Gallardo seems to be the hit pick. He's only been a top-level manager now for eight years in the Nacional and then River Plate. But he seems to be the hip choice. Again, that Tifo Football said, oh, could he be Barcelona? Because tactics-wise, it matches up and, and River Plate play the way that Barcelona, that, or we believe that Barcelona would like to play. And the other idea, too, is that while Tata Martino didn't work coming from Argentina, uh, Gallardo seems to just not only does he have the fire but River Plate is just a different animal over there it's a different job the pressure of, if you can handle the pressure of River Plate 
Barcelona is just a little bit ratcheted up more, if that makes sense. Barcelona is a little more pressure filled than River Plate. That's certainly on a global to a global audience. But I mean, River Plate is not an easy job. You wake up every day and you have a lot of people who expect the most out of you. And he has done a great job with River Plate. So I think credential wise, he's earned it. The one thing I do want to say is people know some of the other jobs I do. There have been rumblings that uh, he's actually had to not about Barcelona, but he's had to come out in the news and say, you know, whether it's Barcelona interest or MLS's into Miami. It's so funny to me that now you have managers and this is just the way that how do how do managers work and how do certain guys uh, speak to certain players that Gallardo seems to be a candidate. He says he wants to stay at River Plate, but he seems to be a candidate for either Barcelona or an expansion MLS team in the United States. And Tata Martino, who struggled at Barcelona, uh, was OK with Argentina but yet he does really, really well as a manager of Atlanta United to become the Mexico national team coach. So I think what it comes down to it is that, I mean, Komen might be awesome at Barcelona if he came to Barcelona, or he might really struggle. And there is no formula. We didn't know. Pep Guardiola was a Barca B manager. You have no idea how certain managers will fit with, with certain teams. You just know that a guy like Jose Mourinho at Barcelona won't work. That's what you know. You just know the, the managers. I mean, Sam Allardyce. You can name these these managers who put out a product that you go, that's not going to fit Barcelona. Uh, and then I think everybody else is just, how is it going to work in the locker room? I think there's just so much not to know. Yeah, and agreed 100%. Just a bit of a comment on the side of what you said there then. Um, Valverde got the Barca job because of the great job he did with the youngsters at Bilbao. Um, if you remember, it was... It was great to see. It was great to watch. There was a, a new generation coming through, um, sort of gelling together, taking the team, sort of being respectful to what Atletico, Atletic Bilbao stands for and uh, exciting the, the, the fan base and, and going about it the right way. And he has not done it at Barca. I think that he comes to Barca on that uh, proviso and he just has not delivered. So hopefully the next manager can. And hopefully this show delivered for you as we're going to wrap this one up thanks so much for tuning in you can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe you can find us on social media too or on twitter at the barcelona pod or at hilton d13 for me on instagram at the barcelona pod you know the rest of it closed facebook group where we got these questions tvpod.link backslash group you can help us out on patreon that's where we do our quick take match reviews as well i do a radio show actually the uk in the uk called love sport radio for uh, barcelona it's on el clasico show so i also have that now on the patreon show so you don't have to look for that anywhere else online you can find that on the patreon as well as i've now been putting up if you want to hear this whole show with out ads i now put that up on the patreon as well so there are different goodies that are being added to the patreon as we speak that's tbpod.link backslash patreon also for three dollars you keep us making new shows and you uh, as everyone's been know been hearing and knows as well that for the youtube channel i you haven't seen my face in a while that's because we're trying to figure out a new studio and a new space and to do that uh that's been all the patreon help that we could get for all of that so that can support the show in new ways as well as i mentioned we're on youtube at the barcelona podcast where we had something about messing about enjoy this week and i try to come out with some good stuff each and every week so check us out there hit that subscription button thanks so much for listening to the barcelona podcast until next time we'll talk to you soon and forza barca, barca.